Good afternoon. I am Peter Grant, Downtown Library Supervisor with the Buckeye Public Library System and a member of the AZLA Professional Development Committee. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. The AZLA Professional Development Committee provides enhanced professional development opportunities for members to increase the knowledge, skills, and abilities of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Webinar participants are in listen-only mode. Please post your questions anytime during the presentation in the chat at the bottom of your screen. You can turn on live transcript and choose show subtitles in your Zoom window for closed captioning. The session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Arizona Library Association YouTube channel. A link will be provided in your follow-up email. Lauren Clementino will be your technical director today. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact her via the chat. If you are unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may dial in using the phone number provided in your registration confirmation email. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you complete a simple evaluation survey. The estimated time to complete the survey is two to three minutes. Please take the time to complete it as we use the data to improve our offerings to you and your feedback is important to us. I would like to encourage library staff of all levels to consider becoming an Arizona Library Association member. Among other things, your membership enables AZLA to provide professional development opportunities to library staff across Arizona. Visit azla.org for additional information. Please support AZLA. When you add our organization as your designated charity and purchase through the Amazon Smile portal, Amazon will donate 5% of your eligible purchases to the Arizona Library Association. The Professional Development Committee wants you. If you have expertise in library science that you think would help other libraries and librarians, please consider applying to be a webinar presenter. You will find a link in your webinar follow-up email. I want to invite you to the next program in our monthly webinar series brought to you by the AZLA Professional Development Committee. On September 8th, join us for Indigenous-Led, Community-Driven, Indigenous Libraries Equal Cultural Resilience with Alex Soto, Lourdes Pereira, and Elizabeth Quiroga. Acting as intermediaries between academia and Indigenous communities, Indigenous library staff serve as a bridge between Western and Indigenous epistemologies. They help Indigenous learners connect book smarts with Indigenous ways of knowing. As exemplified by the Arizona State University Library's Labriola National American Indian Data Center, library centers and programs led by Indigenous staff make libraries and archives more accessible to Indigenous populations. In this presentation, Labriola Director Alex Soto, Tohono Odom, and Labriola Student Librarians and Archivists, Lourdes Pereira, Kiached Odom, UMA, and Elizabeth Quiroga, Tohono Odom, will share how culturally informed library and archive services can support retention, academic success, community engagement, and creative outlets for Indigenous college students. Presenters will detail how Indigenous librarianship empowers Indigenous peoples in the pursuit of survivance through support of individual research and scholarship and collective cultural expression, memory keeping, and community learning. Registration for this webinar is posted to the Arizona State Library's events calendar, the AZLA calendar, advertised in the monthly professional development email blast, and a link will be provided in your webinar follow-up email, which will be sent tomorrow. I would like to thank you all for attending today. Please welcome Corey Tuller and Janelle Breedveld for their presentation, Patents and Trademarks 101, What Library Staff Need to Know. Thank you so much, Peter, for that introduction. And um, at this point, I know that we're going to get our slides shared in just a second. Great, thank you, Corey. 
So Corey and I are so excited to be here and present some key information about patents and trademarks that will hopefully help you understand what your patrons might need when they're seeking patent or trademark protections, and will also help you redirect them to some useful resources when these questions come up. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn off my camera just so I'm not a distraction during the slides. So next, we're going to go ahead and show you an overview of what we'll cover today. Now, there's so much to know about intellectual property, so we really wanted to be clear that we're spending time at the tip of the iceberg as we cover the role of the Patent and Trademark Resource Center, the local resources available, and some upcoming and ongoing learning opportunities. Then we're going to descend a bit down the iceberg to give you an overview of intellectual property, and then finally a bit more to cover some basics about patent process and trademark process. Now, if you leave here wanting to learn more, that would be wonderful. If you leave feeling like this is enough for now, that's great too. If you leave here more confused than when you came in, please contact us. We'd love to talk with you one-on-one -on -one to try to clear up any confusion. Next slide. So what is the Patent and Trademark Resource Center program? The United States Patent and Trademark Office, also known as the USPTO, recognizes that it can be really challenging to patent an invention or trademark a product name. So they've established a relationship with libraries from across the U.S. to serve as patent and trademark resource centers, also known as PTRCs, that can provide a local human layer of support. And the USPTO provides ongoing training to these PTRCs so that we can be prepared to fill that support role. The amount of training and commitment involved means that they can't sign on every library, so we're currently the only PTRC here in Arizona. Next slide. So here's a photo from the grand opening celebration on October 9th, 2013. This was at the Capitol, and it may have actually been taken by Peter Grant, who's our moderator today, since he led the effort for us to become a PTRC. So how can we help? Well, first, we can answer questions that patrons may have, like, can I patent my trademark? We can also demonstrate searches. So at a patron's request, we can schedule a Zoom call to demonstrate searches in USPTO databases using generic ideas. Show me the patent. A patron can give us a patent number and we can send them the patent documents. Help me with blank. Now, we remind people we are librarians, we're not lawyers, so we may direct them to relevant pro bono services that could be useful for their needs. And finally, location, location, location. We can direct patrons with Arizona state level trademark queries to the Secretary of State's Business Services Office. So overall, we're called a resource center, but I think that's more of a concept than a destination, especially since the pandemic began. Right now, most of our activities have been through phone, email, Zoom consultations, where, as I mentioned, we can share our screen and demonstrate patent or trademark research. So we feel this has been a really positive pivot for us uh, because we're intent on supporting the needs of the entire state of Arizona, and we recognize not everyone can physically come to downtown Phoenix on a weekday during business hours. Next slide. How do people find us? Well, you saw us on that USPTO map of PTRCs a few slides ago. Patrons might see us there first and contact us. We've also created two LibGuides, one that's for patents and one for trademarks, and people might find those just through online searching and contact us that way. Uh, they may also look to the Arizona Secretary of State's office, uh, their website, since they handle state-level trademark registration, or even our library's website and submit questions to us uh, through the site. Overall, I think our library's website and really our LibGuides are going to be the best places to direct your patrons if they need our services. Next slide. Intellectual property. There are so many different terms, acronyms, nuances in the world of intellectual property, and we know this can be pretty confusing. So today we're just going to give a really brief overview of some of the terms that are associated with each to hopefully help orient you. 
So on the screen here, you can see these are some of the terms you might hear most frequently when people talk about different types of intellectual property protection, patents, trademarks, and copyright. Ultimately, the decision about which level of protection is best in any given situation really needs to be made by the patron, but it's important to um, point to information about the distinctions between these different types of protections. And just to make everything a bit fuzzier, there could even be a need for multiple types of intellectual property protection, uh, but we're not going to get into that level of detail today. Next slide. So on the screen here, uh, you can see a table that has more information about patents, trademarks, and copyright. I'm not going to go over this in depth, but I think it's most important to call out that generally patents are granted for inventions for a defined amount of time. Trademarks are registered and can be renewed for a fee as long as you continue to show evidence of use. And copyright is in effect from the moment of creation. I think you can take away from this table that each type of intellectual property is going to have its own process, timeline, costs, and benefits. So we encourage you to explore this more in depth through some of the resources that we're going to share today. Uh, now at this point, I'm going to pass it over to Corey, who's going to give an overview of the patent process and the trademark process. Thanks, Janelle. Um, I am happy to be here today and thank you for everybody who's attending. Um, I am going to share some basic details about the patent and trademark process to give you an idea of the path that an inventor or a business owner must follow either on their own or with the help of an attorney. I'm going to emphasize the parts where we at the PTRC can provide support and instruction and we are going to start with patents. So um, as you heard, a patent is a grant of a property right to the inventor for a limited amount of time. And the concept of promoting scientific advancement by granting patent, patents uh, is even written into the Constitution. It's really a win-win situation. The inventor gets this exclusive right for a period of time, and the world gets to learn the details of their discoveries. The patent application needs to provide complete details of the invention so that others, once the term of the patent is complete, can replicate the invention. So I wanna show you some patent examples before we talk about the process. So this is an example of a patent that was granted to someone in Jerome, Arizona, way back in 1898. It's a um, patent applications include drawings. And if you're reading the patent application, you can follow along on the drawings as well to better understand the invention. So for this example, the canteen um, fits the frame of the bicycle and needs no clamping devices being held in position by its own weight. Uh, so reading that and seeing it work together to help you really understand what's going on. So in this image that you see, that triangular section near the pedals um, slides down between the posts of the frame, and that's the canteen that was invented. The letter G indicates the cap of the canteen, uh, which can be removed for easy filling. Uh, so this is one example of a patent. Um, here is another. Some patents can seem a bit absurd, um, and this example shows an exercising device for the teeth and gums. Uh, please note that an inventor might have a great idea, and they assume that they can patent it because they haven't seen it available anywhere. Uh, but that's not a guarantee that it could be granted a patent. Um, just because something is patented doesn't necessarily mean it was manufactured. And I don't know if the person who patented this device back in 1923 ever saw the product reach consumers. Um, and I'm pretty sure that there's nothing available on the market today like this. But um, when somebody has an idea, um, it's important for them to do a thorough search to make sure that their idea is new and hasn't been patented before. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later um, as part of the process. I couldn't resist including a library related patent as one of the examples. So here is an improved card catalog drawer. It allows for one handed manipulation of the drawer and it was patented back in 1970. 
here is another example of a somewhat absurd patent, um, a life expectancy timepiece. So I'm not sure if this ever reached consumers either, but the concept was that you could input data and using actuarial tables or something like that, um, the timepiece would start counting down to your demise. Um, and this was patented just in 1991. Um, I think the key point here um, is that Intellectual property is serious business, but it can also be pretty entertaining. Um, and there are a lot of wacky patents that are out there. Um, and my last example um, is for all the pet lovers. Um, here's a vest that was granted a patent in 1999 that essentially makes the wearer a human habit trail. Um, so the concept is that you open a tube and you insert your hamster or maybe a pet snake or something, and that pet can scamper around and be seen by spectators as you walk down the street. Um, so kind of fun. Uh, I believe the patent application also anticipated future applications, like putting other decorations on that vest, like foliage and such. Um, so there you go. There are some examples of patents. Um, these are the kinds of things that we talk about when we talk about patents. So now that we've had a little bit of a mental cleanse by looking at those, um, I'm going to talk about the patent process and how the PTRC helps. So we're librarians, not lawyers. Uh, so the first thing we tell patrons is that we are so excited that you have an idea and we don't want to hear anything about it. Um, it's really important to keep that information private and share only in safe spaces, like when there's a signed non-disclosure agreement. So we encourage you to put up those same boundaries with your patrons as well. Um, here are the steps in the patent process that I pulled from the USPTO website. Uh, that's one of the ways that we support patrons. There's so much information on the USPTO website uh, that sometimes they just need that one-on-one uh, -on -one helpful guide to say, oh, you need this page or you need that page um, and pointing them to where they can find information. So the patent process overview that is included on the USPTO site is very helpful. Um, here's just an overview of the steps. And I've marked the first two because that's mostly where the PTRC uh, can give some support to patrons. So here is an extension of those first two steps. Um, in the patent process uh, from the previous slide. So as it says here, we give assistance and a direction, not advice. Um, and for step one, when they need to determine what type of IP protection they need, um, Janelle talked about this earlier as well, we, we do an intellectual property overview so that they can make an informed decision, but we're not telling them what to choose. Uh, so we just make sure that they understand the distinctions. We'll send them to the USPTO website to also find those resources that help explain it. And um, it's just so easy to get confused with the terminology. Um, when someone says they want to patent their trademark or they mix up their terms, you know, it's especially important that we're helping them um, understand those distinctions so that they can decide how to move forward. So for step two, oops, sorry, I went too fast. Uh, for step two, um, additional information also needs to be conveyed to the patron because in the language of the statute, uh, there are certain things that can be patented and not patented. Uh, the statute says, quote, uh, a pers uh, any person who, quote, invents or discovers any new or useful process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter, or any new and useful improvement thereof may obtain a patent, end quote, subject to the conditions and requirements of the law. So uh, some things can't be patented. Uh, if you do want to patent something, it has to be a new invention and it has to be a non-obvious invention. And for a new invention, that means that it can't already be publicly disclosed either in a previous patent application or in a granted patent or in other places. Um, and for it to be non-obvious, what that means is that someone having ordinary skill in that area of technology um, uh, wouldn't find it obvious. So an example of something being obvious would be a change in the size or color. Um, something like that wouldn't be patentable. The PTRC supports patrons through this step 
by instructing them on searching the USPTO's patent databases. And this is where we spend most of our time after explaining different intellectual property protections. Um, we use generic examples, again, tell us nothing. Um, and uh, we help them see the process to find out whether their invention, their idea is in fact new and non-obvious. So in the past, uh, we had special access in our reading room to the database that the patent examiners use. It was called Pub East and Pub West. Um, there was an exciting development this past year, though, and that was the launch of Patent Public Search. This is a website um, that has all the information that was previously previously available in Pub East and Pub West, and now it's available in a web browser uh, to everyone on their own timeline. They don't need to come to downtown Phoenix, um, like Janelle said. Uh, no special access is needed. So we're really excited about this because it's allowed us to do these virtual consultations. We can share our screen. We can help patrons rather than have them sit close to us and try and peer over our shoulder as we're um, demonstrating things on the computers on site. And uh, again, trying to make our supports accessible to everybody in Arizona, not just the ones that are able to get to downtown Phoenix easily. Um, and that's been important for us. Uh, you see in the top of this slide here, it says search for prior art. Um, I just want to take a quick moment, because um, you may have heard that before. Uh, the art in that phrase is akin to state of the art technology. Um, I think a lot of the terms that are used in uh, the patent world um, can be confusing for people who aren't that familiar. The um, the term prior art, they you might also hear talk of patents being prosecuted or attorneys working for clients and the question to ask is how many patents have you prosecuted? Um, and that term, uh, you know, triggers certain thoughts in our head, um, it, but it, the term prosecute a patent is what they use to say um, applying for a patent and then doing all of those things to uh, make that patent happen. So um, a little bit confusing. Uh, so this is that step. This is the searching for the prior art, us using um, the resources that USPTO have, uh, using generic examples to show what a search looks like. And it's not for the weary. It's um, I don't want to get into too many details uh, because we're trying to keep this very light and stay on that certain level of the iceberg. Uh, but there are limits for keyword searching and uh, a thorough search requires you to search by cooperative patent classification code. And so as we teach patrons about the codes and the type of um, activities they'd have to do in order to find the right code for themselves for their invention, uh, the time and energy it takes it it doesn't take long before they're pretty convinced that an expert searcher is probably going to be needed and it's not something they can handle themselves. Um, the USPTO is always going to recommend using professional legal services if you're not experienced at performing patent searches, which is going to be most of the people that come through our door at the PTRC. Uh, but if it's somebody who chooses to do it on their own, uh, there are some supports in place. Um, to help with that. I'm going to talk more um, about options for legal services um, after I talk about the trademark process. So let's switch to trademarks for a moment. So trademarks um, are words, names, symbols, or devices that are used for trade with goods to indicate the source of goods and distinguish them from the goods of others. So there are so many examples that can be shown and you see trademarks multiple times a day as you live your life, you probably have several trademarks looming around you as you're watching this webinar. Um, you can trademark a color if you look at the John Deere tractor on the slide. Uh, you can trademark the color green. Um, you can trademark a smell um, and we've got the Play-Doh example up there. They have trademarked a uh, their smell, and there are other aspects that distinguish a good or service from the goods or services of others. And so I can show you a couple more examples. So you can trademark a sound. Lucasfilms trademarked Darth Vader's breathing. 
So when you register a trademark, you need to indicate the class of goods and services in which the trademark is used. So this trademark, when they registered it, uh, was for the breathing sound when used for Halloween costumes, incorporating masks, and voice altering toys, and among other things that you see on that list on the slide. So any other company that incorporates that same breathing sound into a costumes mask would likely be infringing on this trademark. And there's no limit to the number of goods and services that you can register for a trademark, except it's a pay to play situation. So it will cost you money for each class of goods and services you trademark it with. And then also, um, you know, again, checking to make sure that no one else already has that trademark. So um, you can also trademark the design and layout of a store like Apple. Uh, their trademark registration uh, goes into great detail about what is claimed and not claimed. And I know this is a lot of text, so I don't expect you to read it, but um, the placement of the walls, floors, lighting, other fixtures, they're all part of the overall mark um, that Apple registered. So the trademark process is also thoroughly explained on the USPTO website. And I included uh, the brief overview steps here, just like I did for patents. Uh, and just like the patent process, we're going to focus today on the first two steps. Uh, remember though, just like Janelle mentioned earlier, the trademark process differs from the patent process uh, because trademarks can be renewed and maintained indefinitely as long as certain requirements are met. Um, whereas patents have a limited time period and cannot be renewed. So just like the patent process, the explanation of intellectual property distinctions is what we start with. It's something that needs to be understood and we assist and direct, but we don't advise. And for the second step, which the USPTO site lists as get ready to apply, there's information that the PTRC can share that helps business owners understand the complexity of choosing a strong trademark. Um, also the importance of choosing the class of goods and services and uh, searching the USPTO databases for similar trademarks. So trademark searching is just about as intense as patent searching, but in different ways. Um, so the database to be searched is the Trademark Electronic Search System or TESS. It's also, it's also available online with no special access needed um, and has been. So that's um, it's been accessible to people, uh, which is great. The goal of searching in TESS and other places for trademark registrations, existing trademark registrations or existing trademarks is um, to see if there's any existing trademark in the same class of goods and services or in any related classes of goods and services. So what you're looking for is that likelihood of confusion. And it sounds a bit subjective, but it's an important aspect of trademark registration and potential trademark infringement. So if your trademark is the same or similar to another trademark in a class of goods and services or a related class of goods and services, then the consumer is likely to be confused as to the source of the goods in front of them. And you may or may not have come across that in your lives where you're looking at a product and it seems pretty close to something else, but not quite. So kind of a knockoff product, which happens, you know, trademark infringement happens uh, all too often. Um, as you saw earlier, the trademark can be a word, a symbol, a sound, a color. Uh, so learning how to search in tests to uh, find those different elements to see if there's a similar trademark to yours uh, takes a lot of instruction and experimentation and, and some skill. Um, and the USPTO has resources to help you with that. Um, but again, it is a lot to learn how to do. Um, a business can register their trademark on a state, federal, or international level, or they can just use it and not register at all. Uh, registration brings certain additional rights though. Uh, and so because some trademarks may not, may or may not be registered, a thorough trademark clearance search needs to include the test database 
and should also include the state trademark databases, uh, business name databases, and just the internet to see if there's any likelihood of confusion with what's already out there. So it seems like a high bar, right? Um, again, the USPTO is always going to recommend using a US licensed attorney who specializes in trademark law to guide them through the application process. So legal challenges over patents and trademarks often make the news, but the trademark infringement suits are a little bit easier to understand and follow. Here's an example of a current trademark issue in the news. The owners of Crumble Cookies are suing two other cookie businesses. In their statement, they claim that the defendants both formed, both formed businesses copying Crumble's processes, trademarks, and trade dress in a confusingly similar way. You can see the example of packaging similarity that they included in their lawsuit here on the slide. Uh, one of the cookie companies uh, being sued, Dirty Dough, has tried to use this lawsuit to their advantage. And on the right are examples of the bulletin boards that they've put up to capitalize upon the publicity with phrases such as, cookie so good, we're being sued, or we don't file lawsuits, we just have better cookies. So uh, again, intellectual property is serious business and expensive business when uh, these lawsuits come up, um, but it also can provide some entertainment and amusement as well. But uh, as I said, trademarks, it's a little bit easier to kind of see that in the news and, and relate to it. And patents are a little bit of a higher bar. So, what I just gave you was a very broad strokes overview of the patent and trademark process. There's a lot to it, and I just tried to talk about how the PTR supports people in that process. Uh, for both paths, uh, the recommendation to use professional legal services can be quite a burden um, for the average um, inventor or small business owner. So with that in the mind, uh, there are opportunities um, that the USPTO has worked on to make legal representation more affordable. So there's a patent pro bono program that has independently operated regional programs that will match volunteer patent professionals, either attorneys or agents, with financially under-resourced inventors and small businesses. Our local program is the Arizona Public Patent Program, and it is run out of the University of Arizona Law School. And so we'll often, um, actually, I think in every case when we meet with somebody, we're going to let them know that this is available and they might qualify and send them to the links that will um, list those qualifications and show them what they need to do in order to qualify. In addition to the patent pro bono program, there are law school clinics, which provide patent and trademark legal services, pro bono, of course, to qualified members of the public who are accepted as a client of the clinic. So University of Arizona has the pro bono program. They also have the law school clinic. ASU has the law school clinic as well. And there are law school clinics um, throughout the nation. Some of them have geographical boundaries of the clients that they're willing to serve, but some don't. And so there are lots of opportunities to uh, apply and maybe get service from a law school clinic. Um, and that makes the whole patent and trademark process more accessible uh, to people. So I'm going to turn the time now back to Janelle, and she's going to highlight some other important local resources that can help inventors and small businesses. Thank you so much, Corey. I think it's always really interesting to hear about those different patent and trademark examples. And I know I'm curious to find out where I can get some pet display clothing. So I'll need to look that up later. Um, on the slide here, we just wanna highlight that there are several organizations throughout Arizona that support the needs of the entrepreneur and the small business owner. And um, whenever we meet with patrons, we do try to provide details about what support can be found elsewhere beyond the PT. PRC. So uh, again, this is just a small subset of examples that may be available. Um, there's the Arizona Small Business Development Center. There are 10 SBDC service centers 
and additional satellite and meeting locations throughout the state. There's also the U.S. Small Business Administration, which provides many supports, including special centers like the Veterans Business Outreach Center and various women's business centers. There's the Inventors Association of Arizona, and that's a nonprofit organization that's been formed to educate, support, and provide a centralized source of information for adventures at all different levels. And they have monthly meetings that currently happen on Zoom. And then finally, just to highlight SCORE, they've provided education and membership to more than 11 million entrepreneurs since 1964. And some of your libraries may actually have agreements with them already to provide free public programming through your business support programs. Next slide, please. Now, other places we like to encourage patrons to visit are definitely the USPTO website and their YouTube channel. USPTO, they're the experts, but their website has so much information uh, that sometimes it helps patrons when we can guide them to specific sections, depending on what they're trying to accomplish, just so they don't get overwhelmed by all the resources available. Next slide. Additionally, the USPTO also has some really great online learning opportunities, so we recommend that patrons check out their events page and also sign up for topics of interest. I know um, I've participated in their Trademark Basics Bootcamp series, which is a really wonderful introduction for anyone interested in trademarks. Next slide. We also specifically wanted to highlight that our PTRC also has an online learning opportunity coming up that's in September. So as you can see on the screen here, first we're going to have an all-day online event on Tuesday, September 13th, and this is for members of the public and of course any library staff who may want to participate. So on that day, USPTO staff, they're going to give a variety of presentations on different topics that you see listed here. And then the last session specifically will be a local resources panel and we're going to have some presenters from some of those organizations that I mentioned earlier including our moderator today Peter Grant who's going to be representing the Inventors Association of Arizona and that's a group that he's worked closely with for a while. Now the next day on Wednesday September 14th we're also going to have a half day of online training that is designed specifically for library staff so any library staff member from around Arizona Arizona is welcome to register and participate. I know um, in the chat we've included there are our handouts for today's event and then we are also going to see some flyers for both of these programs that will have links to registration. Next slide. Uh, just in general, Corey and I want to thank you so much for your time today. Uh, we know that this is a, a dry topic at times, but we think that it's one that could be really useful for your patrons. So we're glad that you attended. And we also hope that if you're interested or want to learn more information, you can definitely reach out to us through our website using that big green ask a question button that you see there on the screen, uh, or you can uh, find our contact information through our LibGuides. We're always happy to set up a meeting with you to clarify anything we can, uh, either to support your needs as library staff or your patrons needs. And again, just to highlight the details about that September 13th public program, please feel free to share that with any patrons that you think might be interested, uh, or the information about the September 14th library training, please share that with other library colleagues who you think may want to attend. Uh, personally, we hope that maybe you'll attend one or both of those programs yourself, just to get more of an in-depth uh, overview and introduction to these topics. And then finally, you should receive a survey from AZLA after today's program. And there is a question about including your contact information if you'd like to be added to our mailing list for future PTRC events. So if you'd like to know more, please make sure you fill that out and then you can get updates from us about other programming we may do in the future. Again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I think that wraps us up as far as our presentation goes, but we'd love to hear if there are any questions in the chat. All right. Thank you, Corey and Janelle, for that excellent presentation. There do not appear to be any questions in the chat at this time. 
Uh, but I do have one or two that I think you will find very familiar and that I think anybody talking with patrons about these topics uh, will hear as well. Uh, and that is patents and trademarks are complicated. How long do they take and what will they cost? Uh, yes, those are very important questions um, that are somewhat hard to answer. Um, the patent process can be quite lengthy uh, when somebody applies for a patent. There is usually um, back and forth with the patent examiner and it um, there's opportunities to improve the patent application as a result of those office actions. Uh, there is, a, let me see if I can find it. I'm gonna share my screen again and show the USPTO website um, because they do include information about the current processing times for things. Um, uh, but while I pull that up and share, um, the trademark process is a little bit less lengthy than the patent process. Um, the fees are on, there's an application fee uh, for both patent and trademarks. There are maintenance fees for patents and trademarks. As, the pat as we said, for patents, they do stop once the patent term expires, but trademarks would have continuous fees. So let me show where to find that information. Give me just a second. And Janelle, feel free to clarify anything I just said while I pull up my screen. I think that sounds great, Corey. I was just going to say, um, if you haven't already found where you're headed, I'd be happy to share the link with you as well. Well, if you've got it and want to share it, that's fine. Sure. Or either way, I can stop sharing. Let's see, one moment here. Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. I just closed my screen. <laughs> See if I can pull it back up again. I will say the fee structure also depends on um, your entity size and there's a fee schedule that's on the website as well that helps determine which category you fit in. All right, Corey, is this the page that you were thinking of? Mm -hmm. Okay, so right now on this page, um, essentially I went to the USPTO website and they do have different sections uh, for patents and trademarks where they break down the process. And one of the very helpful sections is how long does this take? So if you look at this page, they've broken it down by the first office action that happens could take up to 20.5 months. And then they continue to break it down as far as different steps in the process. Uh, I believe that same section. Let me go back to patent basics. Uh, we were talking about cost. There's also a helpful section that says how much does it cost. And this gives you a different breakdown um, based on all these different charges that are involved. So there is some research required on determining which of these is relevant for what you're applying for. And I'll just clarify, um, for any of those pro bono services or the law school clinic, if somebody becomes a client, they're still responsible for the fees um, to the patent, you know, for the patent or trademark fees, they would just get the attorney services uh, pro bono. Um, so that's something that's important for patrons to be aware of. Um, the and I think that, uh, you know, if when people look at the fee schedule, because it's such an investment, you want to make sure that your searching is done thoroughly and appropriately, because it's a lot of money to, to throw away um, if you're not prepared. And so we typically advise patrons to learn as much as they can about the search process. Um, and if they want to do it on themsel themselves, we'll give them, you know, that attention to help prepare them using generic ideas. Uh, but for other people who will be using an attorney um, or an agent, uh, it's important for them to spend time getting to know what's out there as well, because then they'll have more productive conversations with their attorney and be able to better explain how their idea fits in the whole scheme of things and the attorney can do that heavy lifting of a thorough search um, for patents or trademarks but, but the more that the inventor or the small business owner knows going into it the better um, to have those conversations um, continue Janelle if you've got your next page up 
Oh, sure. I was just going to say um, the trademark section is structured fairly similarly on the USPTO website. Again, if you go there and you jump to trademarks under this trademarks basics link, it'll take you to this page where you can find similar information, including how long does it take to register? And then there's also how much does it cost where they do similar breakdowns, just like the patent section. Okay. So I understand that our chat uh, has had some challenges taking questions. So that has been remedied. Uh, if you do have a question, uh, you still do have time to enter it in the chat. Uh, while you do that, I do have one follow-up question uh, to what Janelle and Corey have been telling us. And that is you have mentioned agents and attorneys a couple of times. So can I hire the same people to do my patent and my trademark? And what is the difference between an agent and an attorney? Uh, good question. Uh, let me try and see if I can get this out properly. Um, so a patent attorney is a lawyer, um, somebody who has a law degree. Uh, a patent agent, um, I believe, is just somebody who has passed a certain test and has been um, has the ability to prosecute patents in front of the um, patent trial and appeal board. Um, can you, am I getting that correct, Janelle, in terms of the process, do you know? Um, in the meantime, as you're thinking about that, the uh, trademark, they it needs to be a US licensed attorney um, who specializes in trademark laws, who are, who's your best bet for a trademark lawyer. Um, so those are, they're just, they're two different fields. And so I don't think the same person Again, I can't give advice. I can just direct. I'd probably send um, the patron asking that question to the USPTO to see their restrictions on who can and cannot uh, submit applications on behalf of patrons. Uh, and Peter, since you trained me, maybe you can clarify my answer too. <laughs> Do I have it right with the attorney versus agent distinction? Yes, so both of both uh, of those have passed an examination called the patent bar, which authorizes them to practice before the USPTO. Your attorney has a law degree in addition to having passed the patent bar. Got it. Uh, both of them uh, require what they call a technical qualification, uh, which means they have a background in science engineering so that they're actually qualified to be making legal claims regarding uh, complex designs and inventions. Uh, with you. regard to trademarks, you are absolutely correct. Um, the attorney has to be based in the United States. Um, that is actually related to a fraud prevention measure. Um, and any attorney uh, can represent you in prosecuting your trademark application. There is no special qualification um, with the USPTO for that. Great. Um, I'm happy also to pull up patent public search and just demonstrate what that looks like and do a couple of searches unless you've got some additional questions that uh, I do not see any additional questions. So I think that would be excellent. Uh, oh, we do have a question. <laughs> okay. What recommendations and or information do you have on trademarking slash copywriting for small businesses using 3D printers? to create new products they are creating to sell at businesses and fairs using templates they purchased online. Once purchased, do they have a right to trademark slash copyright as they develop their brand? Basically, any insight into copyright and trademarks on 3D printers. I'm just going to read that again. Sorry. Um, I don't know much about 3D printers. Um, using 3D printers to create products they're creating to sell. I mean, that's just a manufacturing process I would expect. Um, so I think any standard rules would apply and the, the process of manufacture doesn't matter, but I'm going to have to maybe think on that a bit because it's not something I'm very familiar with. So I apologize. That's a non-answer. Um, Janelle, do you have something to share there? 
Unfortunately, I don't. Um, the only thing I was thinking about was as far as trademarking the actual brand, as far as if they have a logo or image or name for their business that they're using, that that could potentially be eligible for being trademarked. But I'm not sure about the question as far as the actual 3D printer process. Um, I will say for copyright, it's it's usually based on literary works and art. art. So I guess if the 3D is art, uh, I don't know. I might deflect to Peter to help out with this question too, and I apologize. So it is a pretty broad and complicated question, but depending on what are they printing with the 3D printer? Uh, because if it is a work of artistic expression, um, it could very well be something that they could protect uh, via copyright. Um, it could potentially, uh, if it is a functional item, uh, be protected by a utility patent. Uh, there's also the possibility that it is an ornamental design uh, of an article of manufacture, and that would be a design patent issue. Um, so really, it does depend on some more specifics uh, in terms of what they are doing. And certainly, um, if we could connect with that individual uh, offline, I think that would be an area where we could give better information. Um, and it could very well, depending on how, how gray this area is and what they're doing, um, that they may need to be referred to uh, somebody who can provide legal advice. Great. Thank you, Peter, for your help with that. So we have approximately nine minutes left. Uh, Corey, if you are still willing to demonstrate a basic search, um, yeah. I think that would be an excellent use of the time remaining uh, yeah. because that will really show us what we've been talking about. Yep, yeah, happy to do so. So if you go to the USPTO website, they have this very convenient menu called Find It Fast here in the right-hand corner. And there is a link to pub patent public search uh, right there at the top on the left. They have important patent links and important trademark links here in this Find It Fast menu. So when you click patent public search, you get to this home page, um, which before you click through to start the search, it would be worth your while to take a look at their training materials here um, and their facts and help supports for any database that's new to you that you're using. And this is what we advise to our patrons as well. Um, it's very it's useful to get familiar with the searching uh, capabilities of that database. And so if you clicked here on training materials, uh, they have some helpful PDFs that could be uh, viewed. They also have a reference guide here, which I'm going to point out to you because it has those uh, index codes that you would need for doing a search in the database. And so there's a certain way that the search has to be formatted to actually have information be returned. Uh, and so, for example, and I'll show you this uh, as well when I get back, but uh, to the other site, if you wanted to search by applicant state, uh, this is the index code the field code. Um, and so then you would have to enter it as a two letter state code followed by that index code. So if they were searching for Pennsylvania, you would put in PA dot AAST, and then you have to have that ending dot as well. And so this has all of those examples, all the different ways you can search um, in the database. So going back and starting the search, and sometimes the load time is quite slow. Um, so let's give it just a moment here to wake up. Uh, they do have a basic and an advanced search mode. Uh, I'm just going to stay in the basic for now. Uh, but here in the upper left is where you would enter that search term that we just talked about. So let's say that we're interested in seeing all of the patents that um, the applicant was from Arizona. So then I would put in AZ as the two letter state code and I would follow about that by AAST, which based on the other document I showed you, we know is the the index code to put in and then you could uh, just put that in and click search. 
and it's going to tell you that there are over 48,000 results found um, and they are displaying you know a certain amount now so just quickly to orient you to what you're seeing we've got three different parts of the screen here we have our search window in the upper left we have the search results in kind of line item form here at the lower left and then on the right we have the document viewer and so the highlighted part here is what is giving us what we're seeing here on the right um, so these are in chronicle or logical order uh, going backwards right now and this includes uh, the patents that have been granted and the patents that have been um, applied for and so this uh, and this is will also help you get an idea of how long that takes from applying for a patent to it being granted as you find ones that are of interest to you um, I will point out that um, you know you can scroll down and you can read through this way sometimes when people are searching to see if patents are um, of interest to them uh, it's helpful to look at the drawings first and so if you you can switch to an image view and here in the upper right of this section and it will show you the drawings and so that's something that you know might help orient you as well and you can uh, keep moving forward so you're going down the list as you see on the lower left where the highlighting section is going down and you're moving pretty quickly through the drawings only here, um, which is helpful. Uh, you are able to um, zoom in if you're having trouble seeing uh, by using this percentage sign. And so I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Oh, I gotta drag, sorry. Um, so it makes things a little bit larger. You can also adjust the size of the windows. And again, you can scroll through until you find one that you want to take a closer look at and maybe you want to uh, download the patent or print it um, and so you can click print to a pdf or you can save here and it will get that ready for you and then you'd be able to um, download the whole patent um, so you see here that let's see besides the drawing i'll give that a moment to Okay, so this is the entire patent in PDF form. You can see it's 19 pages. So there's a lot of printing involved if you're gonna print every single patent, but you can also um, save to your desktop. And it, um, going through the details of what you can see in a patent is uh, a whole nother process. So we don't have time to get into that, but that's basically um, what it looks like to work within here. And you can, it'll keep track of your search history and you can use Boolean operators to combine searches but again keyword searching is not going to help you uh, prior to I believe 1976 and so ne knowing that classification code um, uh, will be helpful um, you can also uh, do a date search as well um, and using a range so they um, you know there's a lot of functionality here and since it is a new site there are some glitches to be worked out. I've heard, um, you know, sometimes it might not work as well on a Mac, which is unfortunate because that's what I use mostly. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are supports, there are PDFs. And if anybody is um, playing around with this and you can't do something that you think you should be able to do, you certainly are welcome to contact us. And we, um, as, as you can tell from the earlier questions, we don't always know the answers, but we usually can figure out how to find them and find the experts who can answer them. So uh, that is kind of what we offer in a nutshell, the ability to connect to resources and uh, redirect and help process a massive amount of information into hopefully smaller and more understandable chunks um, for patrons. Um, and I know that we're getting close on time. So uh, hopefully this was helpful and we encourage you to reach out um, through our LibGuides or through our website um, if you wanna get the whole spiel that we give to patrons when we meet with them. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. Alrighty, thank you again, Corey and Janelle. 
I'm sure if you have additional questions, they would be more than happy and available to address them with you if you reach out to them directly. And we look forward to seeing you in our next webinar. Thank you so much, Peter. Thanks, everyone. Yes, thank you.